LTE on layers one, two, and three with uh, Matthias Huber. Um, Matt is an engineer at Qualcomm working on cellular security research. Please welcome Matt. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, like he just said, um, working on cellular security research and countermeasure. So, two answers to common questions, just to be real quick. I'm six foot eight, and I didn't play basketball, uh, I played volleyball. Um, and then also what I was just talking about, uh, broadcasting a licensed spectrum is against the law. If you're doing it, use a Faraday cage and, or a bag. They work pretty well. Um, and then also this presentation is just information that's public already known. There's no new secret sauce here. It's just all other, it's like a collection of other people's research. So everybody else, everybody's research is sourced on the slides. And I highly suggest you go and look up the, uh, stuff that I'm sourcing. So anyway, a uh, brief overview of LTE architecture for people who are not familiar with cellular. We, just take, we were just talking about a particular slice of this, the full architecture. So we don't have to talk about the whole backhaul, but just this, I have this, this uh, little model here. And uh, we have also uh, a couple acronyms we use or a couple terminologies we use in cellular. So it's good to go over this. So um, when we say UE, we're talking about user equipment. So your phone, IoT device, anything that has a modem. Um, e node B, that's the base station. Um, and then we have this uh, concept of access stratum that deals with everything that has to do with the UE and the E node B communicating over the air and with the radio. And then um, there's this concept of non access stratum. That's anything that the, the UE is communicating to the backhaul, to the actual back parts of the network, not dealing with the radio. Um, and the uh, Backhaul, you have this important thing. It's called the mobility man management entity. This is a, this, the system that tracks where your, your UE, your cell phone moves around. So the, net, the network needs to know where the phone is at all times to be able to deliver service at it. Um, MMB handles that. And then HSS, the home subscriber server, that has the information about uh, are you a subscriber for this, uh, for this cellular network. So if, you're, if you pay 40 bucks to Verizon a month, you're in that server somewhere saying, yeah, I pay 40 bucks, I'm a, I'm a subscriber. Um, this is the Evolve Packet Core. EUTRAN is the, is the technology of, of the access to the radio, so Evolved UMTS Terrestrial Radio Access Network. And then um, the last thing, um, IMSI, I don't know if you guys are familiar with IMSI catchers or IMSI leak. IMSI is an international mobile subscriber identifier, so a lot of these attacks have to deal with uh, getting the user's IMSI. Um, so anyway, uh, we got the uh, LTE protocol stack here, so this is just like a really quick um, <laughs> overview of LTE. So we're going to be mostly talking about physical layer here. Um, and then we're, we're going to be talking about the uh, packet data convergence protocol here. And then lastly, we'll talk about radio resource control and non-access stratum. Don't worry about what these are just yet. We'll talk about it when we get there. Um, so LTE is actually pretty secure once this completes, once the authentication key agreement completes. So we're dealing with an over-the-air protocol, so we have to start from a place that's not secure. And then eventually, we, we, uh, we uh, authenticate each other, the user and the network, and then we set up encryption. So essentially, uh, fast forwarding through this, um, the UE here decides to attach to the network, sets up an RRC connection. So RRC is radio resource control, um, radio control. Then we, then the, uh, we send a uh, non-access stratum attach request with the subscriber identifier. The network goes and checks if you are a valid subscriber and uh, generates um, authentication vectors here. Sends that back down and the, the UE gets now a um, authentication request with this token. Um, there's, there's a shared uh, secret key on both ends of this. So in the SIM card, it's not your IMSI, it's called K. It's a cryptographic key. That is used to, set, uh, to uh, check this authentication token that the network generated also with K at the very end. K is never transferred, but numbers are generated from K. Um, yeah, sorry, I skipped a little bit ahead. And uh, that, so because of the UE knows K and the network knows K, the UE is able to validate that this authentication token is correct. When it does, it responds, it generates its own response to the challenge. And now we have mutual authentication. Both ends have just cryptographically verify that they both know this, this shared secret K, so a symmetric key. Um, that allows us to set up encryption. So you actually have two layers of encryption and integrity protection in LTE. You have one that actually deals with NAS, the, the network, so the backhaul, 
and then you have one that deals with, uh, with the um, access stratum, the RRC. So there's, there's an encryption between you and the tower, and there's encryption between you and the network. Um, so anyway, before the AKA completes, this is all of our attack space. So we, while, you're, while you're attaching, and you're synchronizing, and you're, and you're getting the AKA ready, an attacker can send any kind of non-authenticated message to you and actually control UE behavior. So this is, this is bad. This is why all these things become possible. Um, anybody's able to send this message to your phone over the network and your phone obeys, following protocol. Uh, the people who made the protocol, 3GPP, they had a primary objective of interoperability first and security third, fourth, something. So that's bad. I mean, uh, you, you kind of have to make it something that works first. And it's also, it's also amazing that we have these devices that can beam data out of the sky. I mean, it's really crazy how you think about it, but we just take it for granted. Um, but security is not possible in this initial attack space. You, you can't immediately start communicating with somebody over the air and have a secure connection. You have to negotiate first. So anyway, um, and uh, lastly, this is the last part of the overview part. Uh, there's uh, numerous actors in this, uh, in this space, in this attack space. So there's hobbyists. Um, there's research where I'm at. Um, an increasingly amount of criminal and we'll talk about this in the end. Um, Software-defined radios are, are getting very, very cheap. Um, people who have some very little know-how can start making money using these exploits. Um, so we're seeing a lot of increase in criminal activity. Law enforcement and espionage, you guys are familiar with MC catchers, all that stuff you hear about on the news. That's mostly, uh, those things are $100,000 a piece, stingrays and stuff like that. That's mostly, you know, law enforcement, CIA, whatever. Um, you'll see these a lot around airports, uh, federal buildings, DEF CON, and uh, <laughs> yeah, um, embassies. So yeah, m a big news, I think in April, the Department of Homeland Security was, was complaining that they were finding MZ catchers or surveillance devices around the DC area. And that made like national news. People that work in this space were like, well, duh, we already know this, but it was like big deal back then. Um, lastly, we're going to be talking about jamming. So jamming is technically under like the realm of electronic warfare. So, you know, in an actual like hot war, you can deploy some of these techniques to, to bring down your LTE in an area or, or stuff like that. So that being said, we'll start with layer one. So we'll talk, start with jamming. Um, I've really simplified this part and it's actually not my expertise. So apologies ahead of time, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to get through this. So um, the goal of jamming is to inject interference into, the, into your target, into the receiver. So um, when you inject interference, you drop what's called signal to noise ratio. It makes it hard for the receiver to extract the signal from the noise and interference. So um, LTE in the downlink uses this technology, this, this amazing technology called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing or OFDM. That allows your like very, very efficient use of, of the cellular or the, the, the electromagnetic spectrum it allows for uh, you know these crazy bandwidths that we have on our phones. Like your phone's basically like broadband speed most of the time, hopefully, right? Um, all that stuff, really, really cool technology. But it relies a, a lot on synchronization and con like your phone and the network are constantly optimizing and synchronizing with each other. Um, that makes it uh, a problem if you jam or if you interfere with this this constant negotiation that's happening on with the network. That um, you can break LTE pretty easily. So uh, there's different types of jammers. There's like a barrage jammer, all, all, all these other type of jammers. With LTE, since, the, since we're using OFDM and all these other uh, 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 modulation techniques, all this stuff, you, you actually need to build a smart jammer. You can't just, well, you can, but it's very inefficient. You just have to broadcast with like a huge amount of power trying to jam LTE, because LTE is very, very resistant to like, to try to, uh, sorry, excuse me. So you want to build a smart jammer because essentially it allows you to synchronize to those control signals and then you jam them and then you break, you break the, the, there's like a cascading effect. You we'll see what's going on. Um, there's also, so your phone is actually usually in what's called RRC idle. The modem is usually turned off and waking periodically to wake up to see if I have any traffic and then go back to sleep. So when you're, if you keep the modem from going from RRC idle to RRC connected state, 
you effectively jam as well because you keep the mo you keep, can't get to connected state. You can't get data. You can't get any, any can't get any surface. Um, and then if you really really jam something, you, you cause radio link failure. You, that's just basically we have to start over from scratch. Radio link failure is bad. Um, so, okay, a little just a quick slide about orthogonal frequency divisible. You have you have these uh, you have all these uh, subcarriers here, and this is in the frequency domain this way, right? Um, on this platform, or on this, uh, this is a time frequency lattice. So you have multiple subcarriers that are orthogonal to each other. We won't get into the crazy, but, but um, getting the signal out of this, out of this uh, time frequency lattice, you use uh, Fourier, four, Fourier fast transforms, pops the signal out, you're able to decode bits out of the signal, essentially what you're trying to do. Um, so uh, when you're jamming LTE, so this is, this is an actual, sorry about this, it's probably small, but this is what it actually looks like. And see the time frequency domain? So um, right away when your phone's turning on, it needs to listen to this, what's called the primary synchronization signal and the secondary synchronization signal. And that happens here, this, this initial uh, burst of it. And then you see it happens here again. And this just repeats on and on and on and on forever. So it's constantly, this constant like, Here's my signal, here's my signal, here's my signal. Measure it, measure it, measure it. And you're able to, the, the UE is able to decode what's called the physical cell ID out of those two signals. Um, and once you know the physical cell ID, you can then decode this next thing, which is the cell specific reference signal, uh, which are these, what are called pilot channels. So these are the, the pilot channels are very, very important. They guide the UE back into the, back into the next stages so that we can, we can start decoding the signal out of the air. So, um, to jam it, you you actually have to sniff the PSS and SSS first, and then you can find out where in this. See these white bars? You don't know where that where those little red boxes are until you decode those first, and then you can know. Okay, that's where this is where the pilots are. Jam those, and um, this keeps uh, UEs from attaching to the network, not kicking people off the network, but keeping you from attaching up onto the network. So um, that's first. Then there's what's called a physical broadcast channel. So a physical broadcast channel, uh, after, you, after you decoded all this stuff, you're able to decode this. This is on the very front end here, and it's repeated every, you know, every, uh, everything, every uh, beginning of the subframe, or beginning of the frames, it's repeated. Um, you jam this guy, and you uh, keep the UEs from decoding the master information block. And the master information block has this very, very important like timing information, all stuff like that. Um, that keeps the UEs from camping onto the network again. But if you sniff this master information block and start decoding information from that, then you can actually open up more attacks. So you're starting to basically, we're building a smart jammer now, you're starting to basically be like a UE, starting to attach and synchronize to the network and starting to decode information from the network that'll expose the network's vulnerability, the, the tower's vulnerabilities. So after you've even decoded the master information block, we can actually then decode these system information blocks, which have configuration information. So um, identifying information about the tower, uh, we, can, we can see who the tower owner is, the operator. Um, we can um, then also get these parameters. Uh, uh, Enob idle timer is important. The parameters to uh, access the physical random access channel, that's the, uh, that's the channel that if you jam that, the UE can't attach as well. But then also you have paging channel. If you, ja if you uh, can jam that paging channel, um, you can keep the UE stuck in RC idle. So we're always talking about going from RC idle to RC connected. If you can't hear paging channel, the paging channel is what wakes up the UE out of, out of RC idle. So, um, yeah, this one, this one is uh, kind of weird, but basically um, this is an example of an effect where if you jam this, PC, uh, this uh, physical control format indicator channel, um, and um, you, you stop the, the UEs from decoding this, uh, this control format indicator, uh, it breaks the next channel. So this is like we're having a cascade effect now. So it's just an example of that. But um, so let's say we want to jam the entire tower, <laughs> kick everybody off the tower, keep the, like, we're, like earlier we are talking about kicking off target UEs. We can actually jam in the uplink direction. So jamming in the uplink direction makes the tower not be able to, to to see anything coming from all of its servants, all the people, uh, all the clients. Um, so if you, if you jam this uh, physical uplink control channel, 
There's this uh, uh, uplink control info stuff that's very, very important for the network to constantly synchronize. It's like, you know, your, your UE is constantly going like, oh, I have this kind of measurement to, to you. I have this kind of signal. Um, I'm, I'm moving in this direction, this kind of stuff. And that's constantly used by the, by the, the cell tower to, to retune and calibrate this stuff. So if you jam that, you actually jam the entire tower. So, um, and uh, so, that, okay, all this stuff is, is sourced from this paper at the bottom. At the end of this uh, paper, they have a discussion about the cost of the effectiveness of jamming. Um, you have this, uh, I like this number here, J over S. So what that is is basically uh, jamming, how much jamming power you used over the signal received at the, rec at the receiver. So if you're very, very inefficient, you're using a lot of jamming power and to get minimal signal degradation on the, on the endpoint. If you're very, very efficient, you're using, if you're building a smart jammer, you're using very little jamming power to just break everything. So we, we rank, rank everything based on efficiency and then also complexity. Um, complexity is, uh, you know, how much of a smart jammer do you have to be? How many, how many signals do you have to decode to be able to jam this? Then it becomes more and more complex because you're actually implementing, you're starting to implement a mini cell phone. It, once, you're, once you're really building a smart jammer, you're, you're basically building a mini cell phone. Um, and that's it for jamming. So, uh, okay, now we're moving on to layer two, the alter attack. This was uh, disclosed, I think, in April um, by researchers in Germany. And um, it's kind of a theoretical attack in the, in the regard that uh, you, have to, um, you have to intercept and have a, have a relay in between the UE and the network. So um, intercepting and holding on to that is kind of difficult. We'll see why, but um, for, for <laughs> to pull off this attack, you have to, you have, to have a uh, malicious relay, you, not a man in the middle, Technically, what we're seeing on, on the relay, since uh, the device earlier, the uh, authentication key agreement, we can't do a man in the middle because there's mutual authentication. So you're going to fail. You're going to fail that crypto challenge and, and all that stuff. But you can just forward the traffic, the encrypted traffic, to the actual network, and just act as a relay. So we're not a full man in the middle, but we're a partial man in the middle. And then, since you're encrypted traffic, you have to. Um, we're targeting DNS packets, so you have to deduce which what is the, what traffic is DNS packets, and then you have to alternate the DNS destination IP and like a DNS redirection attack on an encrypted packet. So you don't know the contents of it, but you're able to deduce what it is and also you know where in it where it is, and and we'll see why um, why we can we can do this. Um, so we're and this part we're talking about the packet data convergence protocol. Um, what this does is it actually converges uh, user plane data and control plane data. Um, to, to the uh, radio link control and, and all these other lower layers. Um, the uh, the uh, DNS, actually, DNS requests actually will be going up to user plane data up to the IP layer. So this is what handles the, the uh, DNS request. It actually encrypts it, all that stuff. And so, um, okay, and just so I'm sure you guys are kind of familiar with DNS redirection. So we have a destination IP address. Um, we want to modify that. And um, so uh, the packet here is actually encrypted in AES counter mode, which is not a, it's uh, AES as you think of block, block uh, cipher, but AES in counter mode is actually a stream cipher. So since it's a stream cipher, we're, ab the, the, we're able, the, the packet is malleable. Um, there's no integrity protection. There is a checksum, we'll get to that, but there's no, there's no, um, nothing stopping me from flipping a bit in the message and changing the message. Um, we need to manipulate this destination IP address to target our malicious DNS server, and the UE will, will redirect. Um, I noted this really before the talk, but yeah, if you use DNSSEC or TLS, this won't work, because you're, you're, the next layer is gonna, okay, anyway. So, <laughs> um, so this is just a, a, a we have the holding, the holding this relay and actually delivering the authentication key agreement here is a theoretical thing and, and not detailed here. But if you did get this, which it is possible, then you're able to manipulate the DNS packet going on, going here, and you, have, you manipulate the destination IP to your, your malicious DNS server, and then you have it being relayed by the actual network, by the way. This has to go through the actual backhaul. And then back to, back to, the, to the relay, which then, which then 
the UE gets the, the incorrect source IP or the source IP to your malicious HTTP server. So notice HTTP, not HTTPS. Um, anyway, so you have these DNS, or you have these, uh, you don't know if they're DNS packets or not because they're encrypted. So how do you find out? Um, well, you can, by their length, narrow it down to about 96%. And then you can actually forward it to a DNS server, and if you get a DNS response, then it is a DNS packet. Um, and uh, we're manipulating a malleable ciphertext, so we don't need to uh, manipulate the whole thing, just we need to create this manipulation mask. We need to manipulate just the destination IP, so we can change the, U, the DNS redirection. Um, you have a plain text M, and then, you, and then the ciphertext here. Um, this is what we got. We're manipulating the ciphertext to actually have a manipulated ciphertext C prime that will generate mani manipulated plain text M prime. How do we find out the manipulation mask? How do we find out what bits in the key stream are being applied to the, the original destination IP to uh, pop out um, the original, because uh, we have the original ciphertext C. That's, all, that's it. Uh, well, we know where the, the IP is because it's, it's a certain offset. Um, and we know that phones and all this stuff have a default DNS server. You can find that out through other analysis, but let's just say it's set to Google 8.8.8.8 or whatever. So you can actually know what the original, just for that manipulation mask, you know what the original um, data was there. And um, then you uh, manipulate that to what you want the target to be. And you take this manipulated plain, the, 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 the output, you take that manipulated plain text and you, and you bring it with the original plain text you zoom them together and out pops the key stream, right? Zor is an inverse of itself. So it's a, it's a chosen ciphertext attack. You can find out what bits in the key stream are encrypting just that DNS destination IP and then encrypt your manipulated one to that knowing the, knowing the bits. So anyway, um, so we've manipulated this destination IP address, but we're now violating checksum because we've changed uh, the bits. So let's say we change the bits from 8.8.8.8 .8 to uh, quad 9, 9.9.9.9. .9 it's not a malicious DNS, but let's just say we've just added four extra bits, right? We had eight, um, uh, you know, eight in binary, but now we have nine. So we have an extra bit. So we just got to generate four extra bits. The checksum in the IP header is going to be off. It's, it's going to be off by, by, uh, by uh, those four extra bits. So what you do is you can, you can manipulate any of these other fields in the, in the IP header that don't deal with routing or anything that you would break. Um, a good candidate is the TTL field. So a time to live, you know, number of hops until we drop the packet. Um, you can manipulate the TTL field to uh, get those four bits back to not violate the checksum. Same problem, we don't know what the TTL field is originally because it's an encrypted packet. Well, phones have a default TTL value. You can find that out too. You know, it's like you know, 500 or something like that. And, um, and also it helps that our relay is only one hop away, so we're not changing it, we can just, anyway. So the TTL field is a good candidate to use. Uh, what has to happen is that the, um, the manipulated IP addresses and its octet plus the uh, manipulated TTL field all has to, has to not change the checksum. So when you, when you do that, when you, you, know, you change the destination IP address and you check, make sure the checksum is not violated, um, you're, you're successful in the, in the regard that you hope that the, the thing when it's being delivered by the network actually gets there because you've manipulated the TTL. So the TTL actually can be decremented to make this, this uh, math work out here on the bottom. And then your, your thing won't actually get there. But if it does, it works. And um, they were saying that they were like 94% effective. So uh, they actually showed it to be feasible with a, with a test harness and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, you just have to make sure that the, everything sums up correctly and it works. So anyway, um, moving on to layer three. So this is more uh, where uh, I'm at. So um, RRC and NAS are these uh, radio resource control and non-access strata messages. Um, like I said, you're able to send these to the UE before authentication. So these are, these are messages that you can send um, and, the, and actually control UE behavior. So. Um, I already talked about why is this, why is this uh, possible? Well, because of the nature of an over-the-air protocol and because of the way they specified, the 3GPP specified protocol that uh, they needed, they needed um, 
uh, basic interoperability primarily and security later. Um, so, and um, also, yeah, I have to note, so I've been reading the 5G um, security spec and it's slowly trickling out. Um, they are narrowing this attack space. So they, they realize that there's a problem here and they're, they're, they're uh, moving up authentication um, and you, you can't be issuing these kind of messages without being authenticated first in 5G. So very, very good um, that that is being. So um, how do we, uh, how do we trigger, so the UE, your, your, your device is constantly like, constantly like uh, evaluating other cell towers and trying to find the best signal. And um, so you're, you're, the kind of example is I would say is, uh, you know in Wi-Fi you have like your home network, you attach to it and you choose that and you choose every, you know, you, I want to connect to uh, Starbucks open Wi-Fi, I want to connect to this. Um, you, the user has control over Wi-Fi, on cellular, they don't. So the, the device is constantly reattaching to other networks but on its own. And you don't have any visibility to it. Android doesn't draw anything, iPhone even less. Um, it doesn't tell you other than like you're on AT&T network um, and you have four bars. That's all that's exposed to APIs, really. I mean, um, so uh, your, your UE is constantly switching to other towers and occasionally it's actually turning off encryption and rebuilding encryption when it's switching. Sometimes that has to happen. So it'd be like your Wi-Fi has got a little padlock. Padlock's going on and off, like turning on and off and, and, and you're like, why is that happening? Well, cellular, it happens. And it's all behind the curtain, you don't know about it, but it's constantly a, it's constantly a thing. So we're, as an attacker, we're able to intercept you because of the, this, for a very moment, because I was talking about this attack window. So, how do you do that? Um, the simplest and the easiest way is to transmit at higher power. So you, co you come in with a tower that's like, hey guys, I got amazing signal, everybody come to me. And all the, all the devices will go, oh. The thing is, if the device is happy where it's at, if you got four bars where it's at, it's not gonna reselect. Um, you can uh, broadcast as your tower under the system information blocks I was talking about earlier. You can broadcast as your, um, your tower. You could say, my tower is AT&T, and Verizon, and Sprint, and T-Mobile. Like, all, all in the US are you know, four big operators. Um, you can actually broadcast as you're being a multiple operator cell tower and um, your device wants to attach to the network that's its home network. So if you're moving onto, uh, if you're uh, roaming, if you're going to, let's say you're going to another country and you're roaming onto other networks, the device actually struggles. It goes, I don't want to go to any of these other networks. I want to look for my home network first. And then eventually it gives up and it, and it attaches to the visiting networks. So if you're broadcasting as the device's home network, you're, you're, even, you're even better. Um, there's also this thing called tracking area code and tracking area update. So if you remember the mobility management entity, that part of the backhaul, um, that constantly is handling the, the, the knows where, the, where you are in, geographically and as you're moving around to other areas. So as you're moving around to other cell towers, the network is constantly doing this process called tracking area update. Um, once the tracking area update is completed, you're given this tracking area code. If you broadcast at any other tracking area code that's other than the tracking area code in this certain area, let's say our tracking area code is 1234, and I just broadcast a tower with a tracking area code 4444, or a different tracking area code, all your UEs are all gonna think that they're moving into this different area, and they're gonna start communicating with your tower, talk, start trying to do this tracking area update procedure. So, this actually is way easier than the first two bullet points. You can just do this and it works. The, the UEs all switch to, to your tower going, oh, I need to do tracking area update because I'm moving into a new area. Um, and that's how you get them. Um, you can also configure attractive reselection parameters. So there's this constant load balancing parameters that the networks do. The network, this, the backhaul of the network is actually really cool. It's a self-optimizing network, the SON. They use, they use these things. So when one cell tower is being overloaded, another cell tower's uh, parameters will become more attractive so that devices load balance themselves, it's kind of, kind of cool. Well, you can just maximize all those parameters and make your, make your tower even more attractive. Then likewise, once you've attracted somebody to attach to you, you can do these techniques called cell imprisonment where you make it hard for the device to, to escape from you. So cell towers always broadcast their neighbors. They go, this, these, these are the neighbors and these, these are the different frequencies that are available. These are the different areas that your device can reselect to. They, give, they always give you a way out. They always give you like, like if you attach to me but you're moving that way, you know, um, if you're an attacker, you just say, I don't have any neighbors, there's no, there's no towers here, I'm the only guy, sorry, stay on me. Uh, that's cell imprisonment. 
Likewise, you can jam other towers, what I was talking about earlier. So if the UE is happy on its tower, you can jam it and it'll reselect yours. Um, the more sophisticated, so the stingrays and the stuff that I was saying about that were more expensive, they are combinations of jammers and fake towers. So they jam all the other bands and they keep their, their band open. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's more sophisticated attack, but you can, you, can, you can combine all these attacks to make you more, more effective. Then lastly, we're gonna talk about channel hijacking. This is a theoretical thing that's pretty new uh, research, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. So what I just talked about that last slide is just triggering reselection. How do you trigger the UE to start talking to your tower? Um, here the UE is attached to the real network, and from whatever, how we did it from this previous slide, we've triggered reselection. Probably the tracking area code different or whatever. So the, in this, actually in this scenario, the, the UE is thinking that it's performing tracking area update. So it's saying tracking area update request. And we all, this is super simple, all we have to do is reject with a specific cause code. So the cause code is, in this case, I think it's cause nine. All it does is it says UE cannot be identified by network. Per protocol, th per 3GPP protocol, the UE then sends a TACH request with its IMSI. So it just, uh, getting, the, getting the victim's IMSI, the subscriber identifier, is trivially easy. Um, when people are like, oh, these IMSI catchers, all these sophisticated things, it's not, they're not sophisticated, they're just simple. They go, track your update, reject, cause nine, give me your I identifier, and, the, and per protocol, the UE follows that. Then they just simply just benignly reject you. They go, oh, oh and they've captured your IMSI. So this is an example of like a surveillance device, simple. No, no like uh, attack here, just a privacy leak. Um, we can actually uh, get a little bit more nasty here. So um, same call flow uh, and the MZ is leaked again. You know, nothing, you know, nothing stops you from also getting the MZ on this attack as well. But then we send this special attach reject at the end. We don't do a benign attach reject like the, the previous example. We do an attach reject that says EPS and non-EPS services are not allowed. That means 4G and non-4G services are not allowed. That means your phone's modem starts a timer like a 10 minute timer and turns itself off. And essentially you've just tricked the, the modem into denial, to its own denial of service. Um, the only way to get out of it to, without waiting for the timer to expire is to power cycle the device. So, uh, no, the modem turns off. So airplane mode turns off the modem, but uh, mo the modem goes to low power mode. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. Uh, if your phone is SIM hot swappable, some phones the SIM is not hot swappable. You have to reboot when you put a SIM in. But the, if it is, the, the SIM can get loaded. Um, then you, you just pop the SIM back in and out. And um, I think the, the, since the SIM is being read, it'll turn the modem back on. Um, and like I said, it's a 10 minute DOS. It, it, it's it's uh, uh, super easy to do this one, just like the previous example, because this is happening in the protocol layer. Um, it's not like if you were doing a jamming DOS or all that stuff, you, you'd have to get a little bit more sophisticated. But the um, uh, the modem turns off and it starts this T4312 timer or something like that per, per protocol, per spec. Um, yeah, one thing I forgot to mention, all these messages, all these things that we're sending in these layer, layer two, layer three attacks are all valid per protocol. We're not, we're not like doing any like remote code execution or any like exploits here. We're just sending a malicious certain, malicious sequence of messages and uh, we're controlling UE behavior. Like I was talking about earlier, this message coming down from the network turns your modem off. They can go, they can, the network can go turn your modem off remotely and your, net, your modem goes, okay, I'm following protocol, I'm following the rules. So now we can get a little bit more nasty. Um, we can do a downgrade. So uh, like I said, 4G is actually secure. 4G has mutual authentication. Once, mutual, once the authentication key agreement is passed and all that stuff, we're good. 2G doesn't. 2G has one-way authentication, the network authenticating the UE, and then even then, that's optional. And then 2G has uh, uh, null encryption support, so you can not have encryption, or it even has weak, like certain 2G encryption algorithms are weak. They're, they were from the like, Cold War era, or like, like we didn't want to give the third world countries strong encryption. So one was, like, one was an encryption scheme that was for export, and, and the other ones were actually used internally in the US and the UK and all this stuff. So there's actually, there's actually like e, uh, EEA1 and EEA, I forget, um, are actually weak encryption. And um, at DEF CON, I wish I had brought my, uh, I wish I had brought the, because at the, um, 
data sharing village or whatever, they were, if you brought like a six terabyte drive, they had the, the GSM uh, rainbow tables for the, for the weak encryption. So I was like, oh, I wish I had, I wish I had uh, brought that, yeah. So anyway, uh, uh, so when you have no, in, no, integrity, or no authentication and no encryption, what do you have? A man in the middle, like on cellular. So um, this is bad. Uh, one thing to note here is that this downgrade actually, so this downgrade is not the best in the, well, I think, is that um, it says actually EPS service is not allowed, which means 4G is not allowed. So technically the modem has a way out that they can go to 3G. And 3G service is there, the modem actually will attach to 3G. So I don't, I don't think this is actually a feasible downgrade in most cases because of uh, 2G, here in the US, 2G is deployed as a backhaul. There's only, there's no like 2G towers broadcasting as in like you can attach to me. 2G towers are still here and they're using what's called circuit switch fallback. So uh, uh, LTE is a packet only. So LTE doesn't have, uh, LTE is packet switch, doesn't have circuit switch. Circuit switch is the old, you know, patching cables like hello, hello, you know, PTS, uh, PSTN, correct. So uh, when we are making a phone call and voice over LTE is not available, we have to downgrade what's called circuit switch fallback to either 3G or 2G. So 2G is still deployed here in the US even though it's not, um, it's not uh, uh, being broadcasted. Like if I'm like sweeping around, I can't find 2G towers. I can find 3G and 4G towers. They're not, they're not broadcasting their, their existence, but they're, they're still there as part, part of the backhaul. So your modems will support 2G for a long time. Uh, getting ahead of myself, but yeah. So people are like, well, 2G is not there. Why, are, why is 2G downgrade still possible? Um, so okay, this downgrade here actually may allow you to select to 3G. It's not as good. This downgrade though, so uh, after RSC connection setup and RSC connection uh, setup is complete, we can actually send this message at any time, but in this example, we, we leak the MC first and then we send this message, but you can send this RSC connection release and say redirected carrier info. So what that, and, and specifying GRAN, specifying the GSM radio network, and that, what that does is forcibly switch your modem, it says, Redirect to this radio technology, redirect to 2G, and even listen to this frequency. So it's really specific. It tells the UE, go straight there. Um, and then you have the no encryption and, and all stuff. Um, bad, very bad. Why is this possible? Um, so, and redirection is a very important thing for 3GPP when the people designed this protocol. They always wanted to have this redirection capability and it has to be as lightweight as possible. Because in like an emergency situation, say there's a, you know, a big catastrophic emergency and everybody's trying to use the cellular network at, at, at once. And the, okay, also the cellular network is also the primary emergency uh, communication system too. So all the emergency infrastructure all relies on the cellular network. And if you, if you uh, uh, have an emergency situation, there has to be emergency services available. There's, a, there's like their primary thing. And we're not caring about security or anything like that. We're caring about load balancing and interoperability here. So the, and when they were doing the protocol spec, they were, they were like, in a case where one tower is being overloaded in, a, in, a, in an emergency situation, they're allowed to redirect to other towers and other radios to, to load balance and, and to spread, to spread the, the, the service around to other, other parts of the network. Um, that's their justification. Uh, that being said, we have to deal with the mess. It's very bad. <laughs> the, uh, the, the unauthenticated message coming down to you saying switch your modem to 2G. And unless your modem had some sort of countermeasure in it, they will, they will switch to 2G on this particular band even. So you don't even have to do any trickery about uh, having the modem switch to 2G and then having your tower there with like select, reselective, uh, like highly attractive tower, you just say go to the 2G band that the tower is already there. So you have, you have two, you have a, like in my lab I have a, an LTE tower downgrade you to a 2G tower and, and it, it works. Um, so okay, this is an example for something from my lab. Um, once you're downgraded to 2G, it's actually really simple to do a fake SMS, um, uh, you, have a, you have a full man in the middle, so you can do any more malicious stuff. Um, you can do fake emergency messages. So this is that um, emergency broadcast system, or a CBS cell broadcast system in 2G. Um, and, that, and that's uh, like, you know, Amber Alert. So even if your phone's on silent, 
phone will wake up and go burp, 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 and draw this draw this uh, toast notification and just yeah. And it's funny when I do it in my lab, I have like I have like a multiple bunch of devices. They all go off at once. It's like it's like uh, we call it the panic attack. Uh, so a fake emergency messages. And um, it's not in here, but you can actually put URLs in there, and it'll draw as a clickable URL. So you put phishing links in there. And um, you can do uh, fake SMS. So in China, there's, a, there's this rise of uh, criminals using a, a cheap software to find radio. Um, all these tricks I was telling you about, they, they, they trick you onto the, the downgrade onto the 2G network, and then they serve, serve you up fake uh, SMS. So they serve you up phishing SMS. And uh, the, uh, the paper I read, it was like for about, uh, 1500 bucks of, of initial equipment purchase and then some technical know-how you can be start you can you can make your money back within like a couple days and so it's a pretty lucrative thing in China um, another thing in China is uh, they have what are called authoritative numbers so the bank the government like certain entities have a phone number in China if you're delivering a fake SMS you can spoof I can send an SMS from 911 that's an example of an authoritative number here right so uh, you can say, you know, the Bank of, Ameri or Bank of China is telling you that you have suspicious activity on your account. Uh, please click here to go to account recovery, you know, and then they have some phishing site or something like that. So um, people don't get tricked by phishing emails as much anymore, but phishing SMS and phishing emergency messages have like a little bit more authority to them. So uh, it, it works because people are like, ah, text message. I have to click on this, but anyway. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about um, is uh, channel hijacking. So I said this was more of a theoretical thing. This is brand new research um, that uh, the uh, University of Iowa and Purdue came out with, um, and it's really cool. Um, we're only going to talk about one particular part of it, but um, so this slide is uh, about the, the attach procedure that we've already gone over. And then once you're attached to the network, the modem actually wants to go into idle state. And um, it has what's called this paging cycle. So it sleeps and it wakes up on this paging cycle and it listens to the paging occasion on the paging channel. Sorry. Anyway, uh, paging means that, uh, so I sent something to your phone and that, that you know, SMS is coming over the network to your phone and your phone's sleeping. It wakes up that one time to hear the paging channel and the network it right at the same time because we're, we're synchronized, the network goes, page for you, I have a message for you, wake up. Then the, the, the device moves from RC idle onto RC connected, and then we actually deliver the actual thing. So uh, paging channel is very important. If we were jamming it earlier, like I said, we are DOSing all the devices that are listening to the paging channel. But in this case, we're going to inject traffic into the paging channel. So what's cool about this attack is that it's uh, possible to attribute or who's, who's doing the attack. You're masquerading as a legitimate tower, and you're like, all the other attacks I was talking about earlier, you have like, you have the actual legitimate towers and you have your fake cell tower and you're trying to trick people to attach to your fake cell tower to launch these attacks. Here you're injecting traffic into the actual legitimate cell tower. So it's kind of it's cool. Um, uh, so paging messages, they come in the downlink. They don't have any kind of encryption. They can't. Paging messages are purely like network saying, you have something, wake up and get it. Um, so uh, what you do is you, you uh, you uh, actually have to, to configure your tower to, to look like the exact paging channel of the other tower. You have to actually like sniff these uh, system information blocks, these two. And then you can configure your tower to have the exact same paging cycle. So remember the device waking up on that paging cycle? Well, now, now your paging cycle is on the same thing. Um, the UE only responds to the first receive message. It's actually interesting when I do this, when I do this attack is uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a case where uh, the, the UE is camped on the network and the network is de delivering these pages with this much signal. When you're, when you're injecting your traffic, your traffic is actually interference at the beginning. So your modem just goes, ignores it. And then eventually your, your signal will, will beat out the actual legitimate network. And then there's like actually a confused period where we're not getting any signal. And if you're not careful, you'll get radio link failure. But then, uh, then on the other side, um, your signal becomes the signal and the network signal becomes noise. So you actually are doing a DOS in this as well. If you're, if you're hijacking the paging channel, the device can't hear pages from the legitimate network anymore too. Um, last bullet, I just basically said that. So anyway, uh, so there's three different things you could do with this. Like I said, if, you just paid, if you're hijacking the paging channel, you've just kicked the person off the network stealthily. Um, 
they don't have no idea that they, they can't, because they can't hear pages, they don't have no idea, they're completely oblivious. Um, you can actually do the panic attack. So this is in 4G. So the other panic attack I showed you earlier was a downgrade to 2G. You can actually deliver fake emergency messages in 4G. You send a page, you have the emergency bit flipped, like there's like, in the page it goes, uh, uh, I have a emergency message for you. The device wakes up and it listens to uh, SIB 10, 11, or 12, and in there are the emergency messages themselves. So without any authentication, without any kind of um, connection to the network, the device hears that bit, goes and decodes your, 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 your emergency message, and then draws it on the thing. Like I said, emergency messages have to be very lightweight. They don't have any kind of authentication. This is like in an emergency situation like I explained earlier. The net, this network has to broadcast those things when the tornado is coming or when the earthquake, the tsunami is coming or, or whatever. Um, and then uh, the, last, the last one is uh, energy depletion attack. This one is not so bad for your mobile phone, but it's devastating for IoT. Um, you just continuously page the victim over and over and over again. So you make them wake up, try to attach the network, and if you can get them to do the authentication key agreement every time, actually you're making them do some cryptographic math on the, on the processor. Um, so uh, you just, you just uh, continuously page over and over and over again, and you uh, perform that, that battery drain. Uh, the actual effectiveness, it probably is like, you know, an IoT battery that should last like 10 years, now you're killing it in a couple days, I think. Depends, depends. Depends on the DRX cycle, other things, but anyway. So that's pretty much it. So there's a little conclusion here, and then we're, we're done. So um, barrier to entry is dropping rapidly. I told you, I told you guys about how cheap software-defined radios are getting. Um, and uh, LTE is gonna be around for a long time. I know everyone's like, oh, well, 5G is coming up soon. LTE is gonna be around for a, for a long time. Uh, um, yeah, GSM is still around, so like I was saying earlier. Uh, and okay, in my lab, I use, uh, I use a software-defined radio and open source software. So open LTE is all right. SRS LTE is a little bit more mature. Um, you, can't just, uh, you can't just like have these things work out of the box. You actually have to configure them to work maliciously. But once you do, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're ready to go. And then um, lastly, uh, I, have two, I have the, the LTE tower downgrade you to the 2G tower. To run the 2G tower, you use OpenBTS. And OpenBTS is actually very mature. Uh, G, uh, GSM is older. So the open source software for the older, older stuff has like, been around for a long time. So OpenBTS is actually really cool. If you have a software-defined radio, it doesn't even have to be the ones that support L the LTE bands, but an uh, older one is that just has a, a duplex. Uh, uh, you can run OpenBTS, and, and that's your own mini uh, 2G network. So like uh, at Burning Man, they like had a bunch of the software-defined radios, and they and they set up their own little mini GSM network. Uh, so broadcasting on licensed spectrum is illegal. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there is what's called broadcasting on the test band, and broadcasting is the test operator, test PLMN. So. Uh, uh, PLMN is the, is the code of the mobile country code and mobile network code. So at t is 310410. Um, if you broadcast it as 00101, you're technically the test PLMN. Um, and uh, you have to have SIM cards that have the, that, that operator in them for, that, for the device to think that, that it's its home network. Otherwise, it'll, uh, it'll think it's roaming onto that. And then um, you use the test band, which I think is band two. Uh, which is 900. Uh, uh, so, question is: Is it legal if you're in the middle of nowhere? I think I'm not sure if anybody cares, but uh, yeah, you're technically broadcasting on licensed spectrum. So, use your own discretion. But yeah, at home. Yeah. So for LTE. Uh, um, LTE has to be on USB 3.0, and um, when the when you're flashing uh, the 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 like open LTE or all that stuff, the, it it the uh, so I use a UHD a USRP hardware driver. It it checks it does clock tests, and if the te if the clock speed is incorrect at all, then then it, it won't work. So L LTE actually needs to uh, it needs to decode the signal and do all this, uh, all this uh, digital signal processing to demodulate the signal out of it into its bits, and it needs to do that very, very rapidly over, over like over um, very small. Like I was talking about earlier about OFDM. Um, so uh, 
LTE, you, you can't do LTE on any kind of cheap SDR. The ones down here all support it. So the B210, that's the one I use. That one's about a thousand bucks. Um, the HackRF uh, uh, and um, uh, BladeRF. So when I was at DEF CON, they just came out with this new one. It's 400 bucks. And it it's, goes up to six gigahertz. And um, it's smaller. Uh, the US RP board, Edis Research, they have the, the have used pretty mature software to uh, load, load, like these things are field, program, field programmable gate array, or FGPA or, or FPGA. So they, they need very good software to load the, the to flash the, that stuff. And so uh, the B210 I recommend, but it's also the most expensive. So you don't have the external GPS? GPSO, yeah, or no. Don't need it. Those are external modules that you can load, but they, they don't need to work. They don't need to be there for, the, for any of this stuff to, to work. Um, actually, yeah, if you want to do that kind of stuff, uh, you, need the mo you need the physical module and you need the, the software uh, set up too. So <coughs> getting started, I would just, I would just uh, one of these SR, uh, one of these, um, these uh, uh, three SDRs, and I would get started with just the open BTS first. Um, and, that, and, and setting up that first. And that, that, that's the training wheels, OpenBTS is very mature. Um, and then move on to the, the other LTE specifications. Uh, here's the sources, so the jamming paper, highly recommended. Um, layer two uh, attack, the, the alter attack, and then um, uh, the uh, paging channel hijacking. And that's it.